Okay, I think maybe we are live. <laughs> Let's try this. Welcome Hello. everybody. This is a live virtual town hall with your fifth district legislators, Senator Mark Mullet, Representative Lisa Callen, and Representative Bill Ramos. So let me tell you first how this is going to work. We received questions ahead of time through email and through SurveyMonkey. So we have some questions already. If you have questions that you want to ask, please, and you're on Facebook or on YouTube, please put your questions in there and we will try to get to them. One thing I do want to tell you is that sometimes there are questions that are very similar. So in those cases, we'll just grab them all and like turn them into one issue. Okay. And now we're going to go to opening remarks and let's start with the Senator. Hmm. <laughs> Having weird audio. I don't know about Bill and Lisa, but it's fine. I can hear you good. Okay, I couldn't hear L Lilia at all. Are we going? Yes, We're you're going. live. Do your intro. Live and you get there to you start. Go. I couldn't even off. hear what Lilia said. Uh, well, yeah, this is obviously a little unusual. Normally, Bill, Lisa, and I would put a lot of miles in our car as we drive around the fifth legislative district from Maple Valley to Snoqualmie to Issaquah. I guess we're we're friendlier to the environment this year because we're all parked in one spot. And uh, but I am Senator Mark Mullet. I this is my third term representing the district, and I guess a couple of big issues. Obviously, we heard about a lot in the interim. For me, was around the business closures and trying to get kids back in school. So that was where I focused a lot of my energy for the first half of the session. Uh, I had sponsored a couple, co-sponsored a couple bills to get businesses reopened and the kids back in school. And it took a while on both fronts, but I am happy that we've made some progress on, on both issues with the governor's office and those fronts. And with that, I will turn it over to Bill or Lisa. I don't know who wants to go next. So hi, welcome. Thank you for putting up with a virtual town hall. We're excited to um, virtually see here and be here with all of you. It's hard because on our side, we don't get to actually see you. And that's, that is very, um, that's a tough thing. We like, we like to, at least I love to see your faces. And that was one of the great things about the in-person town halls is getting to shake your hand and getting to have, you know, more, um, person to person conversation. So I just, I, I appreciate you all showing up today. And, you know, if your questions don't get answered and all of that, I just wanna make sure you feel free to reach out to all of our offices and just really plug in and connect with us. Um, we're, we're definitely there to do that. So this session, I am serving on the Children, Youth and Families Committee. I am serving on the Education K-12 Committee. And I'm also serving um, as Vice Chair on the Capital Committee on the House side. And I certainly came into this session you know, full on wanting to make sure that we were addressing equity issues, making sure we we're addressing our healthcare issues, um, and absolutely want to make sure that we were dealing with recovery and stimulus, and uh, of course, um, wanting to take action around climate, um, making sure that we're we're doing all we can to create some sustainability of where we need to go in our climate crisis. So, with all of those fronts, you know, my my actual bill movement has been very targeted towards uh, the behavioral health needs of our, our family and our youth. I took over as chair of the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Work Group that the state runs this interim um, and have done a lot of work in that regard. So really focusing on this first part of session around the health care and then, of course, doing all of the work we can to make sure that we're doing what we can do to get our schools rolling and in motion and supported and um, some budgets. Uh, stability and of course some economic um, relief and support for our businesses and in particular our small businesses. So thanks for being here and looking forward to uh, talking to you through our questions. Thanks Lisa and Mark. Um, uh, Bill Ramos again, great to be here uh, again as everyone else says, it really miss seeing everybody in person and getting that much much more connection as we talked about the issues. Hopefully, as, the, as things progress, we'll be able to do that in the near future. Um, so, of course, we're working on all the obvious things from COVID and the recovery in schools and businesses and all those things, and not to diminish those at all. But to add to that, the other things I've definitely focused on this session, uh, the first one starting uh, last spring, early summer, along with the rest of our society, I uh, started, the, uh, started with the policing policy leadership team and focusing a lot on police and criminal justice reform issues. Uh, I've also, since that time, since in the last session, been working a lot in our transportation arena, uh, putting together a new transportation package proposal 
And uh, that's going to be a big topic of conversation. And as we go on, we'll give you more details in all these. And always, I'm working in the environmental side under natural resources and the committee I'm there uh, also. Uh, so those are the kind of the three focus areas I've got besides the obvious ones we're all working on. So I think that's a good wrap up. We'll get into some of these questions in a little more detail as we go along. So I'm so glad you're here and thank you. All right, thank you. So we are going to start with the topic of capital gains. I will read you a question, but there are numerous you. questions about this. Oh, the Senator can't hear me. Okay. Yeah, I'm having a harder time hearing Lilia for some reason, but okay, go Lilia, ahead. You're cutting yeah. out for me as well. Yeah, a little bit here um, too. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, um, let's see if we can do this. The first question, it is from Ron, and he says, although I am in favor of a more progressive taxation system for Washington, I am somewhat concerned about the addition of a capital gains tax as it relates to retired Washingtonians with minimal or no significant earned income. This form of taxation will disproportionately affect retirees who may live exclusively on capital gains distributions. So if the Senator could not hear me, would you, would one of you please just relay the issue oh, so that- No, I heard that, that was fine. That, that oh. came through totally fine, so I don't know, but uh, the federal issues will sort themselves out and I'll, I'll wave if I, for some reason, can't hear you, but uh, okay. the Senate was, the first one to vote on the capital gains tax. They did it uh, last weekend, actually. And I was one of the three Democrats to not support the vote. For, for me, the primary focus was on our state revenues. So in the last recession back in 08, 09, there was some pretty substantial cuts to the safety net in the state of Washington. And when I, not just the capital gains tax, but every single tax increase that I see in front of me, whether that when I was on the Issaquah City Council or in the state legislature, the first place I look is what are the revenues we have at our disposal and can those revenues, one, protect the, the safety net that we currently provide, and two, does it give us the flexibility to make the investments that we need to make that people in Washington rely on? And, and I felt this case, we could do both. I mean, there was some irony to me in the Senate vote that we passed a huge investment in early learning and childcare on the same day we passed the capital gains tax, but the childcare and early learning investments we were able to make from our existing resources in our state budget. And I was not supportive of that tax. And to be honest, any tax that I feel, I'm always gonna view it as a last resort. I think if we have the resources in our state treasury to fund the essential services and make critical investments, then I'm not gonna be looking to support new taxes at any point. You so, head yeah, sure. So from my perspective, I think one of the things we definitely want to do is make sure that everybody's working off of the, the facts around the capital gains um, excise uh, bill that came through. So it, it will not, to Ron's question, I think it was um, Ron that asked the question, um, it does not affect any kind of retirement savings or accounts. It really is around um, gains really mostly on stocks and bonds that are sold in excess of where you've seen gains in a given year of over $250,000. So out of the, I think there's like some, uh, looking up that number, I think it's like 3.4 million tax returns in the state of Washington. After the Senate amendments, only 8,000 people are estimated to have, um, to be impacted by this tax. That's, that's a very small number. The sale of real estate has been exempted, for example. Um, so in there, if there's a case where there might be any kind of asset that has an overlap with the B&O tax, that was taken care of. So I think from my perspective, the, the narrow bandwidth of what we're talking about and the amount of revenue that's coming in that is targeted towards early learning I know that uh, Senator Mellett talked about the Fair Start Act and, and the Senate sounds like they have a pathway forward to fund that. Um, that's not the, the funding pathway that we, we're seeing in the House. Um, and we know that whatever dollars are coming in from federal stimulus are short-term dollars. So we know that we need to make sure that we've got that funding available. And I will also tell you that right now, um, even before the pandemic, we had a significant shortfall in our behavioral health responses across the state and what we're doing, especially for our kids. Senator Mullet has this great bill around school counselors that um, I'm supporting in the House right now, and uh, we're trying to get through to the, the, the bottom line. 
But if we don't have enough counselors in our schools and we can't increase the number of counselors in our schools, then we're going to continue to have that deficit. So these are the things that we can't pay for today. And that's why we need the funding. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, my way of looking at taxes, to me, um, we have a very, everybody has heard this before, a regressive tax structure yeah. where folks making minimum wage pay about 18 percent of their wages into uh, in taxes. And, and, the, and the folks in the higher uh, economic structure pay about 3 percent. So there's about a six fold increase in the amount of folks taxes that people pay in the lower side. That has to change. That's not fair. It's not right. And so my goal is to to hopefully shift that burden to a more fair thing. So that's first what I like to do when we do get talk about taxes is shift that burden. And also to only need new taxes if we're really funding something we don't have the money for now. Um, and uh, as we talked about here, uh, the Senate has passed this bill. It hasn't come to, to the House yet. Um, so we will be you haven't even started hearings on it yet. I was thinking they're going to start this next week or so. And so it'll be coming to us for discussion and we'll get into those details. Um, but I, I like what I'm hearing so far in the fact that this does start to shift that tax burden to the higher income folks. And, and we can help take that away from the lower income folks by with that bill funding two things that it looks like it funds for me, child care and early, early childhood learning. That's a critical piece that we've had hit, we had trouble with funding these things in the past. It's even worse now with the pandemic. We have to figure out a way to do that. That's gonna bring about good quality education. That's fairness. That's getting people to work because their kids have a place that they can take care of. That's a critical piece of getting our economy back. And the working families tax exemption is, which is a piece we did pass in the house, um, which is a critical piece of getting money back again into the hands of the folks that are not making that much money as, as kind of a rebate on their sales tax that they pay. That's a critical piece. So we have not voted for it yet. There's possible changes to come. Uh, so we don't know exactly how that's going to come out of the house, assuming it does. And we'll have to look at those details as they happen. But the way it's structured now is, is a step in the right direction for me as far as how to rebalance this tax code and pay for some of those things that we need to help us recover from this pandemic. Okay. So another issue that we have gotten a number of questions on is kids going back to school. So the question is kind of, uh, when will our kids be back in school five days a week? Five days a week. Rep Callum, please, please start with that <laughs> as you lead us on the uh, K-12 education committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, certainly I can say from my perspective, I'm all about what we can do to try to get our kids back into schools. Um, you know, I've talked about my emphasis around behavioral health and the needs for our youth and the amount of increase of um, youth and teen suicide and suicide ideation just from the beginning of year, I think has increased 25%. It is dire, it is a crisis, and we need to do something about it. And certainly making sure that our kids have what they need through um, our public schools is just, it's key. It, it truly is paramount. And our state has always stood there. Um, it's important that we do it all, of course, um, in, a, in a healthy and a safe way. And I think all of the school districts in the fifth, I stay in touch with them. I stay in close touch with them. I have conversations with, uh, with the superintendents and I reach out and connect with them regularly. And they were all ready and planning to get back in some form or fashion um, by the end of April. And we're, real, we're right on track with the governor's um, executive order that was, uh, I think it was Friday, was it Thursday or Friday that came out and um, to try to get kids K through 12 back in some form or fashion. The five days a week burden can't, I, that, um, that won't happen in the middle and the high schools until we can, re we can actually um, reduce the six foot uh, requirement by the Department of Health. So I know uh, I am constantly hitting refresh on the CDC guidelines and constantly looking at how that translates into what we can do here in Washington State and looking at the science and pushing hard to figure out that we stay and we track with the science around that so that we can reduce that footage. And then in the meantime, um, you know, our school districts are doing um, a huge amount of work of trying to figure out how to get our kids back in the buildings at least part-time, right? And I think, I, like I said, I think all of our school districts in the fifth were on that pathway. And uh, certainly the federal stimulus money that's coming in, 
um, will help. The districts in the fifth, I will tell you, are not gonna see a huge amounts of that money because it's the way it's distributed by formula coming from the federal um, from the federal government. So I also want the the you know all of our constituents to know that there's not this windfall of cash that's gonna land in their lap that just gives them this ability to create, you know, huge um, huge mountains to move, at least in the fifth. But I am I am deep in the weeds with trying to figure out right there with them on how to do that. And and I will say I, I feel obviously I will give some credit to the the families in Issaquah. They've been one of the the most vocal in terms of trying to get kids back in school. I think they actually, some of the groups that are organized here have actually spilled over in some of the neighboring school districts and they should know. I think their efforts pay dividends. I know I co-sponsored Senate Bill 5039 when the session started, which was, you know, the first week of January. It, it was hard during, you know, the past nine months before session started not having a voice really because we weren't in session. And so when session started, it, it was, kind of refreshing to be able to have a voice again and really weigh in on these issues. I, Governor Ensley, I don't agree on everything, but I discovered early on in session that we did agree on this issue around getting the kids back in school. And I was dancing a jig on Friday when he came out with this proclamation to basically, because some of these negotiations, I think that were happening at local level were really dividing communities. It was really not productive. I think the governor did everybody a huge favor by just laying out, here's a clear path. You gotta be back in at least two days a week and Representative Callan's 100% right. We should have five days a week or at least four days a week. I don't know what we're gonna do on Wednesdays when school starts in the fall. And we definitely, Department of Health, I think is gonna change their guidance on that six foot rule down to three foot because the science, the science completely supports lowering that threshold down. And I think they will get there in the next month is my hope. Okay, our next question is about the GET program and they're asking, why does it need fixing? Oh, well, I sorry, have a, the, What was the I, question? Can you repeat it? The program for college savings? Yeah, the uh -huh. GET program, why does it need fixing? Well, I can speak, I have a bill on GET to try to make it more affordable for Washington families price we get unit last year was $121. This is when you pre, for people who don't know about get, it's when you buy tuition, like your kid could be in kindergarten and you go and you buy a year's worth of tuition equivalent at the UW, and then they will honor that when they graduate from high school. So it's basically buying college, you know, at today's prices for 15 years down the road when your kid goes to college. The One of the challenges in the get program right now is the price of the units was going up more than what the UW was actually increasing tuition by. And that's because the legislature has a policy that says tuition can only go up by inflation. Our state actuary would always assume that we're gonna abandon that policy. And so the bill that I passed out of the Senate that's in the house now is gonna make sure that get units are staying more affordable for Washington families and, and would provide immediate relief for any family that bought get units this past year. But I don't think get is broken at all. I think. The only thing we have to make sure is we keep it as affordable as possible for all Washington families who choose that program to save for their kids going to college. 50, 5430 is the bill number, I think. <laughs> it'll, it'll be coming your way at some point. All right, we'll keep an eye out. <laughs> okay, uh, we have several questions on transportation. So let's see, uh, Mary Lou Pauly, who you know, is asking, there's a term floating around out there, the transportation grand bargain. Can you explain what this means and what items you are supporting? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump into that one first. And, and the grand bargain is interesting um, the terms. Right now, uh, as far as the transportation package goes, which is a, usually packages are usually like 16 year uh, program to fund and, and expand beyond the normal transportation uh, uh, budgets. And, and the Senate has a few ideas and the House has one idea. And there's a, so, and there's a whole bunch of other ideas coming along with, with different uh, uh, carbon fees and, and cap and trade taxes. And, and there's just a whole bunch of things floating around transportation, low carbon fuels. And so these things really, um, they, they aren't independent of each other. If there is gonna be a transportation package, we have to get to one, not three. Um, and then these other things really fold into transportation. And so a lot of people say they have, we have to somehow get, bring them all together. So we, 
address all those at the same time, all dealing with transportation um, in that focus. So some people talk about that grand bargain, but there's definitely negotiation going on on both uh, sides of the rotunda, uh, as well as uh, some, the Senate has a few proposals in there they have amongst themselves as well to deal with. And we can get into the details of that later, but that's kind of that, that grand bargain thing of putting it all together where it all makes sense. And you don't have some things kind of conflicting with each other in that transportation arena. Okay. Would, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'll no, say no, I no, would echo, I think, what Representative Ramos said that I think for us, I think the three of us on this call, we want to see Highway 18 funded. Rep Ramos has also done an excellent job of getting a lot of other projects on the house list, not just Highway 18. I mean, like the roundabout out by Remlinger Farms and a lot of other great projects. And but I think these three are connected, whether the price on carbon, the clean fuel standard, and the transportation package are basically, in my view, all in bed together. And the legislature, we, I think, can pass all three of them, or I get nervous that everything could die. And so everyone, I, my hope is everyone keeps an open mind on all three of those topics, and we try to get everything to the finish line by session and April 25th. Okay, staying on the same uh, subject, because it's very much related, um, Nate is asking about State Route 18. How will you um, protect all types of wildlife? Wildlife, well, um, you know, the, the, the news is that 18 is there already and it has impacted wildlife and it's been there for many years. Um, the, the, pretty much when we do any reconstruction, we'll go through an environmental analysis, whether that's SEPA or NEPA or both. Um, acknowledge, but we will do that and we can't do any harm to that. Hopefully we'll actually better things. If we're rebuilding stuff, we will uh, do betterments to both fish passage usually as well as wildlife crossings. Um, and so that works uh, and when we're rebuilding things, we get to fix some of our past mistakes and that's an advantage we have. That usually also drives up costs because those things add, uh, add that if we're putting a bridge in versus a culvert, there's a lot of different uh, additional cost to that, but it, where it's keeping fish habitat is keeping our salmon alive. Those are costs we are willing to, I think, take as a society because that's what the right thing to do and to keep uh, our uh, wildlife and our fish in a healthy state. Okay, we have, we're switching gears completely here, folks. Uh, from Jeanette on Facebook, she's asking, could you address Senate Bill 5140, the protecting pregnancy and miscarriage related patient care? I, I can speak to that. I, I don't think Rep. Callan and Rep. Ramos have seen it yet on the House side. I did come through the Senate side. It was, I think it's an excellent bill. I, I voted for it. I think we saw it, you know, when we had, you know, the Swedish merger um, most recently, and then you had CHI Franciscan with Virginia Mason. And so it's important in the sense that, I guess specifically, if you have like an ectopic pregnancy, and you're basically having a miscarriage, we wanna make sure that no matter what hospital you're at, you get the right medical care for dealing with that miscarriage. And I think it's an important bill this session and I hope it passes the house. Okay, next yeah. we are going to guns. So there are numerous questions about guns. So let's just talk in general, what is the legislature doing this year? regarding gun control. I'll let you take that, Senator, to start because we don't we haven't had a gun uh, bill on our side uh, yet today <laughs> in the first half. You've got a little bit. Yeah, and there there was one very important piece of gun legislation that did pass the Senate. I'm cautiously optimistic. I think it'll pass the House as well. I thought it was very reasonable. Even folks who I know their primary concern is the Second Amendment. I've talked to a lot of them this session already and. And they also think the bill makes sense. And it's around open carry on the Capitol campus and it's open carry at demonstrations. So it says, if you have a permanent demonstration or you're on the Capitol campus, we are changing open carry laws and it will not be allowed, assuming if this bill does pass the session, that is the big change. And, and I know that is a gun bill. It did pass the Senate on a party line vote, but I also know from talking to a lot of people in the second amendment space that they, they think this bill makes sense, a lot of them. And, and so I think, I thought it was a very reasonable place to move the ball forward this session. I'm really glad it passed. 
And I'll, I'll add to that as being a, a gun owner on this side here of the aisle. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I support Second Amendment, and I think we need to have responsible gun laws. I think it's interesting that we really, that's the only bill, and I haven't seen that bill yet because, like I say, it's in the Senate side coming to us. It's the only gun bill uh, that, that's come up this year. We've had a lot of other things to deal with, with uh, uh, and so that hasn't really come up much. But uh, as, as the way Senator describes it there, uh, I would agree with supporting that. You know, when someone comes to visit me in my office when I'm in Olympia, <clears throat> I don't need him to walk into my office or on the outside there fully armed. That doesn't promote open discussion and con conversations and working towards solutions, which is what the, the legislature is all about. So. I think with the, the design is to have open discussions, conversations, working through points. And uh, it's kind of hard to do that uh, as much as I say, I'm a gun owner, I'm comfortable with them, but I don't need to be staring down the barrel of a gun when I'm having a conversation with someone. So I think that's very reasonable. It doesn't stop you from doing that other places. And, and also in, in, uh, in areas where there's a whole lot of people in demonstrations, you know, again, it just adds a, another element. You can carry it somewhere else. We already have limits on that. You can't walk into a bar and, and do open carry because it's not the right place to have a gun sitting around. There's just too many possibilities of something going wrong. So I don't think this is much infringement on, on folks' rights. They still can do other stuff where they, where they want, when they want, except in a few places that it's just not as appropriate as other places. So I, if I see that bell come over here and, and what I've heard about it, I would probably support it. I just, I also want to just chime in. I mean, I, my comments are very similar to Senator Mullet and Rep. Ramos's uh, certainly. And I can, I can just share, you know, when we are down in the Capitol and we're in person, I think one of the favorite things that, that we enjoy doing, the three of us, is meeting with all of the school classrooms that come down and um, visit and get a chance to engage with the legislature, right, and get to sit there. And we've had a couple of situations um, last session where we had a uh, you know, gatherings that came in with open carry that weren't permitted that actually started to cause lockdowns for our kids. And, and that's not the kind of engagement and civic engagement that we want our, our kids to have, right? We want them to be able to really connect and see. So again, I think there's a time and a place and it's not an infringement on um, looking not to infringe second amendment rights, but certainly understanding how we can balance that perspective out and make sure that everybody has full access to um, to the government when it's in action, I think is, is a uh, key thing to do. Okay, folks, we are about halfway through this call. So please get your questions into the comment section of Facebook and YouTube um, so we can read them out loud. And there's a question here. Uh, student behavioral health is a major issue for me and my family. What is the legislature doing to support our youth? How are we listening to them before acting? I love this question and I so appreciate, um, I think the families in the fifth are very engaged around behavioral health and we have a lot of youth voice that is also very engaged. I know in all of the legislation that I bring forward, I have youth that are showing up that are from the fifth to testify in committee hearings on the bills. And I, I know that they have been um, personally impacted. Everybody, everybody knows somebody um, you know, that is either uh, for themselves or their family members or friends that have been impacted by some sort of behavioral health um, concern and worry and our response around doing that. So as part of the Children Youth Behavioral Health um, work group, we brought forward several recommendations. Um, one of the bills that I've moved forward, which is the making sure we have a behavioral health uh, referral access line that's available for families to call in. So you can try to find, if you have been trying to call and find um, a mental health provider or counselor for your social worker for your child, you know how difficult it is. You will spend hours on the phone. You'll try to find one that aligns with your insurance company. You'll try to find one that's actually taking patients right now. Um, it's just, it's the the ability to even find somebody in the first place is huge. So this referral access line is, is um, one of the number one ways to make that happen. And they partner up with your insurance and your child's needs and your family's needs to try to make that happen. So we want to make sure that's that's moving forward. 
There is funding in the governor's budget for an increase of the mobile crisis units. Um, there's some provisos that I've been requested into the governor's budget around specifically making sure we've got more access to behavioral health supports for our youth that are in crisis, those that are um, in shelters, those that are, uh, are having those extreme challenges um, with family engagement. And what does that look like and mean? I mean, the list goes on and, and I'm not sure who all sent that, but if you reach out to my office, I'd love to get you connected and also have you testify in our hearings coming to the Senate some soon, so please do. Yeah, and I had one bill where I was in Lisa's committee in the House, Senate Bill 5030 was around <clears throat> school counselors, and it's on the premise that I think, I'm optimistic this budget will also send out additional money for more school counselors, but the bill also clarifies that you have to let school counselors at least spend 80% of their time being school counselors. I know from my wife's experience teaching Issaquah, they just get pulled in a lot of directions. They get asked to proctor test and monitor recess and all these other things. And, and as we make additional investments in school counselors, we wanna make sure that our schools are letting them be counselors. That'll get to the point we're looking at of making sure they're able to change kids' lives for the better, not get pulled in eight different directions every day while they're at work. And hopefully that one will pass this year in the house. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, the whole for in the, the mental health picture is, is continues on beyond that. Uh, I worked earlier last year in, in, for counselors in, in the uh, community colleges and, and university level, we're, we're focusing in there too. In our community, adults across, across the spectrum, it is hard to get to a counselor or therapist nowadays. And so some of our bills are working to really increase the qualified people to enter that field, get the schooling and education needed so they can fill those jobs fill those needs so folks can find a counselor when they need it because you can't wait two years when you need a counselor it doesn't work right so what can we do to do that i think that's that's the the, the big issue we're working on is to get those folks trained certified and be available to to everyone in our community uh and, and when they're needed because that's that's just a critical piece and it starts with our kids but it goes all the way up to to, to seniors who have have issues that need need help with right it's across the life spectrum so we're going to try to keep adding more and more folks in that in that uh, with that education to help us. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are switching gears completely. Let's see. <clears throat> Douglas is asking, any insight on House Bill Ten Nineteen allowing the legal growing of marijuana at home? Why is Washington one of the only two states that allow recreational use but don't allow homegrown? I, th I think that bill has died on the House side. I don't think it went forward at all on yeah. that. And so the, you know, I don't know the intricacies of the bill itself since I hadn't had a chance to actually vote on it and dive into it and read it before it came out of committee, certainly. Um, you know, I think I'm, if you've got specifics that we'd like to try to really uncover about how to go forward on that, I'm always happy to have that conversation and try to get into the nuance of it. Um, the committee that actually looks at that and reviews that has the the data on it. So I I, uh, I don't have anything, I guess, to add. Do you guys have any more? Did you have any conversations well, on the Senate I, side? I know what I had heard on the House side was that it didn't meet, like they had some four priorities around, you know, things that they were really focused on this session in terms of COVID and equity and stimulus and relief. And they yeah. didn't feel it fell into those four buckets. I, I think the issue has been around the whole time I've Ever since we legalized marijuana, this issue has been around. I think we're going to get there in some shape or form of allowing home grow at some point in the next few years. I think it'll probably be very limited of what they allow it to be, but I definitely think that it'll end up getting there at some point. But it has been a bill that has been challenging to the finish line. In a limit. Yeah, and just add, I want to uh, add a little bit to what uh, Senator is saying. We, we definitely had an interesting approach this year. We haven't talked about it, but we're all virtual and doing our work a little differently and, uh, you know, uh, worried about how much we could get done in, in a normal session with everything we had to do. And so we definitely had some priority bills that we definitely work on dealing with COVID recovery, equity and social justice and police reform. And those are those are big issues. And you imagine and working through them. Uh, you know, from a virtual standpoint without those face-to-face -face meetings, it, it slowed things down. But I think we did really well. We got a lot of bills uh, halfway through. We got a lot more done than, than we thought. So we'll keep working on those and keep pushing them. And, and the good news is that the 
you know, things that quote unquote die this session. Maybe they didn't, they don't officially, they're still on the books for next year. They can, they can be uh, revived and, and run again next year as we get those two. So they don't have to start over from scratch there. Anything that started this year can continue yeah. next year. So that's a, it, they're half started at least mm -hmm. if nothing else. I see that the, the comment trail that the bill died in appropriation. So yeah, I think that was kind of where the gate was on the um, the house priorities of what they were trying to pass through and what they're willing to to move forward on those four topics. So um, I appreciate you bringing that up. All right, next we are going with uh, Brett who sent a question via the survey and he's asking, can you please explain what you are doing regarding protecting workers this session? Well, you know, we can, I can start on some of the bills on the Senate side. I think there's, there's one around just through the end of this pandemic uh, that, you know, if you end up getting COVID through work that you have extra access to healthcare protections through our state's workers comp system. So I think that's one that definitely is sitting on the house side at this moment. And and I think there's always been a focus with the federal dollars as we send out the federal dollars that come into our state to make sure we're trying to support workers as much as possible. And I think that's been the case before session started and the federal dollars we allocated during session also went down a very similar path. Yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, so so a lot of that is is uh, kind of short term and long term. You know, we were trying to protect our, our particular essential workers, our, our healthcare workers, and, and getting some things going that way. Long term, we're working on legislation that gives uh, workers, particularly ones that have a lesser voice, the ability to have that voice and folks to stand up for them. I forget my bill numbers now. There's too many of them to keep straight, but definitely giving uh, uh, more of uh, rights for vote workers to stand up for themselves or their co-workers that maybe can't because if their job if your job is threatened if there's a situation when you feel threatened in, in the uh, workplace because of a uh, situation maybe isn't safe to work there you want to improve the safety of the working environment or some other reason but you know when you're making minimum wage or, or slightly above and that job is everything to you you don't make waves you don't bring up those issues sometimes so we're trying to hope make that easier for folks to bring up those issues, correct them before they are a problem and, and be able to, to fix that and move on down the road and have a, a stronger voice for, for workers, particularly those that uh, are, uh, are fearful to, step, uh, to bring too much light and, and risk losing their job, which is just absolutely essential to them. Okay, next, Joe Johnson is asking, what are the next steps the legislature is taking to provide all citizens with quality, affordable health care? I mean, I can speak on the Senate side. We did have an update. We call it Cascade Care. It was basically the, you know, the public option bill we had passed two years ago. And you say to people when, you know, we have discussions about universal health care, but I think one of the challenges you have in Olympia is is you move on to the next thing before you've actually successfully got the bill you passed that was the first step up and running effectively. And to me, our state being the first state to pass a public option, and we do have a Senator Frock bill this session that has left the Senate, it's in the House, and it's around providing extra subsidies for people who are on the individual market to make the rates more affordable, provide better coverage. It's a very comprehensive, well thought out bill, I, I was proud to support it, but I am definitely focused on saying, making our public option actually effective and get it up and running and more people able to utilize the savings from it should be our, our primary focus the next couple of years. Okay, next. Um, I think this might be for the Senator, I'm not sure. Can you explain your transit oriented development bill to someone who likes transit and development, but doesn't understand what the bill does? <laughs> I definitely can. It was, uh, and I think Rep. Ramos would appreciate this from his time. We were both on the Espoo City Council. Where a lot of times CEPA review is a big, it, it, for one, it's an expense and two, it's a big potential delay in the process. So this creates the state, a state grant where the city could apply 
to do SEPA for the one mile around their transit zone. And if that, those grants would basically make it easier to attract people to build housing that's affordable in those areas. Because for one, they don't have to pay for their own SEPA review anymore. And two, the risk of a huge timing delay from that process, from the EIS environmental you know, review process is removed. And, and so that bill isn't gonna solve all the problems. It's only, it's a $10 million grant in the capital budget, but it could fund 30 to 40 different type of CPA reviews around transit hubs throughout our state which hopefully if that were to pass would get a lot more you know private dollars to try to build affordable housing in our state as we make our substantial public income. Okay, we have now a question on BNO tax. Okay. My wife and I are self-employed. Our business lost money this year, yet we still have to pay BNO tax. If we were employees, we would not be paying BNO tax. Would you be willing to support a bill to eliminate BNO tax for small businesses who grows one million or less per year? Well, you want to go? <laughs> I, can, I can take it. I don't mind taking it. I, I'll, I mean, I'll trust start. me. I'll, I'll okay, start. go ahead. So, I, I have. The B&O tax is a very strange tax. I've never seen it in any other state. I, I, it's it's, it's a, a formula based on gross revenue of a company. And that tells you nothing about how much money the company is making. And I think that I, I'm just assuming, I don't know this for sure, that it goes back to somehow of a, you know, no income. They can bring in $500,000, but they spent a million dollars. You know, they're half a million in the hole, yet they have to pay tax on that money, even though they're losing money. So the being hold tax to me is a whole structure. I'd love to revamp. You can't just eliminate it because businesses should pay taxes. That's reasonable. But to have a system that is fair and have you pay on, you know, the amount of money you're making, not gross receipts, not with no consideration of what it costs you to make, bring that money in, doesn't make sense to me. So the BNO tax is something I'd love to uh, restructure and figure out how to do that better. And now it's really, um, you have situations like that, you can be losing money and still tax, and that's the way it's structured. You can add more to that, Senator, but. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. And, and one bill, I think in that regard, that was really important that we passed was, for the businesses that receive the paycheck protection program money from the feds, they were going to get charged BNO tax on the paycheck protection, you know, loans and grants. And so one of the bills that both the Senate and the House have already passed, the governor's already signed that bill, is to make it clear that we're not going to charge BNO tax in that space. And and I know the frustrations. I've, you know, the first couple of years you open a restaurant, it's just not profitable. But you're paying BNO tax in those first couple of years. But I think the challenge in my time in Olympia has been, you're gonna eliminate the BNO tax, you have to replace it with something else. And sometimes people like the devil they know more than the devil they don't. And we've never made a ton of progress in that space because you can't just, you need the tax revenue. And if you get rid of that tax, you have to come up with the revenue somewhere else. And then wherever you're getting that revenue from is usually, it is not an easy process to get agreement on. So that's the reason I think we've had it around and it's not a great, system but if, if it's not an easy one to fix either no. i think that okay. i just let me add that i think the underlying all of this right is the you're paying the bno tax and the hit and the loss that you took because of the, the the pandemic and the loss in the business i mean i'm still very hopeful that the budgets that come out um will have some, and then of course the federal relief dollars coming in and how we we are able to allocate and spend those will continue to bring some relief, especially to our small business owners, because whether it's your B&O tax or your licensing fees or your ability just to, you know, try to figure out the fluctuation and the business coming in and out of your door, all of that is just, it's, you know, it's been a, um, it's crazy to figure out how to even survive. So I, I think we all have heard this loud and clear in all levels of, of business. And so I think that that's, um, that's part of the bigger question, right? Uh, around the BNO tax, besides the fact that the BNO tax completely needs to be reformed. Yeah. All right. There are several questions about the Blake decision. So if one of you could just briefly talk about that and also say what the Blake decision is for those who don't know. Yeah, I mean, this was a, a Supreme Court decision that came out in the middle of the session a couple of weeks ago that said drug possession is, is now legal 
in the state of Washington, all drugs, all quantities. Uh, the, the thing they were trying to get at is the idea that it's completely unfair to have someone go to jail if they had no idea they were in possession of drugs. So the idea of like somebody thought they were in trouble with the law and they hid the drugs at their friend's house and then their friend gets in trouble and goes to jail for that. That's what the Supreme Court was saying doesn't make any sense. So they struck that from the statute. When they did that, all drugs became legal in the state of Washington. They have been for two and a half weeks. Uh, I don't know, most people, I know my staff at my restaurants aren't fully aware of that. So I don't know how much we want to publicize it, to be honest. But I did sponsor a bill in the Senate to put the word knowingly in the statute to clarify that that's what I think was the idea, that if you're knowingly in possession, it should be illegal. I think the middle ground to me is when you, our past policy cut off, you have to have a bipartisan solution on these things. And I think the bipartisan solution, because you have to get, you have to suspend the rules to pass a bill after policy cut off and we're past policy cut off. And I think the bipartisan solution is to put something in place before we leave town on April 25th to make sure that just all drugs aren't legal, but to have that sunset. And I think if you put a sunset clause on my bill, you know, whether that was in June of 22 or June of 23, that would be a forcing mechanism to come up with much smarter drug policies in the state of Washington. I don't think we're going to be able to get that complicated idea, like similar to what Oregon did. We're not going to be able to figure all that out by April 25th. But I'm hoping that we put something in place so we leave town without saying all drugs are legal until we come up with a new plan. And but we can definitely sunset that as a forcing mechanism that the legislature should come up with smarter policies around drug possession in the state. And I think we could do it. We have several questions around the issue of homelessness and housing and evictions. So I understand that uh, the House passed a bill to um, prevent evictions. Can you talk a little bit about that issue? Do you want to go? Yeah, Pepper, you want to start? So uh, the, the bill that we passed was around just cause evictions. So there's uh, it outlines and and uh, denotes the specific reasons for a reason for an eviction, especially as we start to um, hopefully at some point get rid of the moratoriums on evictions, and we actually can start to get back into cycles of life. We won't want um, you know this slew of evictions that can start to happen that aren't related to reasons that are normally. Um, acceptable reasons for so in working with partnerships with uh, the various landlord groups i think there are some that are in favor some that are not depending on you know the range and spectrum of those that came to the table on it um but certainly from the house perspective and was put, voted off the floor and moved over to the senate the just cause um makes it very uh it outlines the very specific rules around when you can um when you can evict somebody and for what purposes and for what reasons. So it gives some protections around uh, somebody just not liking you, you deciding you wanna do, or if you wanna like even sell the property and do something, then there's some notice requirements around that and being able to do that so that we don't put more people into homelessness. And to add to that is, uh, you know, that what we have going on with the eviction moratorium, you know, that, that that was a very good thing to keep people from going homeless all of a sudden. We would have had a much more serious problem on our hands if we hadn't done that. But when you do that, you just change the natural flow process of things. And some people are way behind on their rent now, right? And so we have created a problem that we have to figure out how to fix. And there has to be a way to try to make landlords whole. I mean, they deserve their rent. Renters, you know, we're trying to give them a hand so that they don't get forced into homelessness because all of a sudden they lost their job because of a pandemic. So it, it is up to us to try to work a, a what they call a runway or a glide path into how with some of the stimulus money we're getting, some of the federal money and some of the other things that we can help uh, transition back to a regular, um, you know, rental business so that uh, it works. And, and that's not going to be easy. Uh, some folks might have thought that an eviction moratorium was a rental moratorium. It didn't take away the money they owed. It just postponed them from getting evicted for not paying it. So we have to figure out how to get their repayment system in for those folks that are behind and still need a hand. Some folks are starting back to work and they're getting back on their own. And, and we got some good landlords that are working out payment plans with them. And some of those things are happening. Uh, but some folks aren't as lucky to have uh, uh, a, such a good working relationship between the landlord and the tenant. 
and they're going to need some help from us to try to keep the last thing we want is get more homeless people because they got evicted because of this pandemic that's the last thing we want as a society so how do we make that work better and and still keeping the landlord tenant relationship whole and and the business whole we would do need landlords to have rental property so people can rent it so we need it's it's a it's a circle that needs to fit all together and we're working on those uh uh how to put something together on that now that hopefully we'll have some some better details as we get towards the end well yeah you had house bill 1236 was the just cause bill rep Allen was referring to the senate bill passed 160 and senate bill 5160 lays out to rep ramos's point says when the eviction moratorium is over which may be april 1st uh that landlords would have to offer payment plans to their tenants and they take that payment plan they cannot be evicted but then if during that and that payment plan can't be more than an extra one third of their rent so if their rent was 1500 bucks that extra their payment plan couldn't be more than an extra 500 dollars a month but then if they can't make their payments if they end up defaulting and the landlord's stuck holding the bill the state is going to help those landlords out because we if, if we're going to have the landlords not evict them and go on the payment plan we're going to help those landlords out that process happens so that bill is in the house right now and i think the combination of those two bills rep macri's house bill 1236 and and senator cooter's 5160 will hopefully be a smart way to deal with coming out of the eviction moratorium. I guess I, can I just okay. add, I just want to add in that I think from a capital budget perspective, I'll put my pitch in now to Senator Mullet on the Senate side to um, <laughs> show forward a, you know, a strong uh, housing investment too in the housing trust fund and in the, um, you know, the, the areas that we know that work in terms of rapid rehousing programs and, um, Certainly, there's a lot of different programs that we have rolling and ideas happening on the house side, I know, that are in dialogue. So when we get into, we talked about what the grand bargain is on transportation, the same thing happens on capital budget, the same thing happens on the operating budget. And so looking for those strong investments and making sure that we've got an affordable housing that's um, taking care of, you know, emergent needs, uh, crisis driven housing needs, keeping people housed. It's always easier to do that than rehouse and then making sure that affordable housing is permanent affordable housing. And what does that look like and mean? So we're trying to address all of those in the capital budget. We have around eight minutes left, so we need to hurry up. So we're going to take a, a question from Doug. It's pretty detailed. So <laughs> the fifth district has over 25,000 acres of DNR managed natural resource conservation areas at Mount Sai, Middle Fork, and West Tiger uh, NRCA. Trust land transfer has been in the capital budget tool for all of this work. How can we continue this amazing conservation program in this year's budget? I mean, I can take that. I think that the rule in the capital and the trust land transfer program is normally like this 80% versus 20% split in terms of the value of the land and, and the revenue it can produce. They, Department of Natural Resources is having a harder time finding land that meets those requirements. But I think the, so the governor for the first time I've been there did not fund any money in the trust land transfer program. So I think what we may have to do in the budget is just write in that those forest lands can't be converted to anything in the next two years and buy ourselves some time to make sure they're protected, but they won't be formally locked up and, and purchased through the trust land transfer program. But at the same time, a lot of those community forests that would normally be eligible that just don't happen to qualify right now, we can, I think through a budget proviso, can lock them up for the next two years. Basically. And, and to add to that, as I heard the first sentence of the question, I knew the rest of it. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. So, so it is the fifth district here has has um, benefited very nicely from this program. We've got some some big acreage that we've been able to set aside and take care of. That's going to help us long term in in our open spaces and our environment and climate change protection and so forth. And we want to continue that. And it helps in many other parts of the state as well. We this is one of the beneficiaries in here. So we do want to figure out a way to do that. Again, it's balancing that budget and putting those those dollars where we can. And, and there's a push to do that. And uh, the, the capital budget folks are, are, are in this meeting here with me. I'm not on capital budget, but I talk to them all the time. And uh, they know where, we, where I stand on this. And we're going to try to 
to take care of that as much as we can this session and, and maybe maybe some more every session as we can because of the, the change in situations, uh, a little different now than it was in the past. So we have to modify that a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I just want to say that the, when we preserve space for long term, that's a major thing that we do and that's permanent. Many things we do in this legislature can change the next year, next year with, a, with another change of the law. But when we set aside something like Mount Sai or, you know, resource area, Middle Fork, these places, they're good. They're, they're going to be there for long term. They're going to help us with climate change, with carbon sequestration, with general forest health. They're going to help us with uh, being out in the woods and hiking and all the recreational opportunities we enjoy. And that's just really important in the long term. That's why we live here. And those are the things we want to protect from the environmental side. And uh, we'll continue to do that yeah, all that we can. Okay, so um, we have very little time left and we have a couple of questions that I think we should still get to. The first one is about vaccines, um, how difficult it has been to get them. So what can you say about that? It's getting better. <laughs> it's been a rough road. I mean, when we started session, we were averaging 14,000 a day and now we're up to 45,000 a day. I know my mom's had both doses of, of her vaccine now, as my wife's folks have. So it was hard finding the appointments, but I mean, I, I it's getting better. I mean, that's all I can say. And it's not where everybody wants it to be, but at least we're not going backwards anymore. And I felt like at first there was so much frustration, but I am, you know, feeling like we're on a much better trajectory now sitting here on March 13th than we were when session started on January 11th. I know certainly with getting educators um, vaccinated, I wasn't expecting them to be able to find very many appointments that were available and accessible, but as the vaccine um, allocation has picked up, certainly there are more getting vaccinated faster than I was expecting. So that's very hopeful. You know, I think the vaccination rates, I don't, I'm trying to check in on that and find out where we are uh, for our school districts across the fifth, but I know that, um, you know, they're, they're definitely moving strong and, uh, you know, they're taking active steps to make that happen, which, which is all an indicator of the access to vaccine allocations that are coming into the state, right, which is, which is a good, healthy um, trend in the right direction. So let's hope it stays that way. I'm confident. Well, that, well. And I think our balancing act is you don't want any slots like not getting used. Right. So if you come up, like for the first time, the last couple of days, we had some slots that weren't getting utilized, which means it's hard because you have to release the next batch. But once you open that next floodgate, now you're opening up to another 300,000 people and it, you can't do all of them at once. But at the same time, you don't want any slots going wasted. So you almost have to have more people in the queue and you have slots available. Otherwise, you might be letting slots go unused any given day. So. I think the other, I'm sorry, you're going to go ahead, though. I just add to that because I'm just feeling very positive in the situation we're in right now. Um, you know, it's, it looks like we're really heading down a path that we can we can turn this thing around and get going right. Um, so very positive in that that we're doing things much better in the last two months. Things have turned around and, and it's it's a positive change. I still do want to bring up the fact that <clears throat> through all this, there has still been an equity issue, as it has been through all of our society. With, with people in, in the lower income neighborhoods, people of color and so forth, they have not gotten their share of, uh, of what they should have as they qualified. And that's a big deal because it continues to show the problems in our society of who gets what when. And that's one of the things I'm working on constantly as we all are equity and getting things we need. And, you know, I hear about when, when uh, you know, some of the vaccination to, to more folks, they went down to uh, clinics that were focusing on people of color and getting their neighborhoods done. And then we had a bunch of people kind of overflow their area and didn't get didn't get the shots they deserved again. So we're trying to balance that out as I'm working in transportation, natural resources, whatever, always trying to figure out how to take care of all of us in an equitable way. And this is one area that, again, the pandemic showed that the inequity in our society and how we're trying to balance that in everything we do. Um, and I'd love to talk more about the equity we're trying to put in the transportation package, uh, but we'll have to do that another day because we're running out of time. But uh, just know that we're all working on that with a big focus in everything we do. We're trying to look at that and see what difference we can make in changing those, those societal norms. 
Yeah, see, that was the question. It was about transportation and equity. So if you can talk really briefly about that. So uh, transportation equity uh, is the transportation package we put together, uh, Representative Valdez and I have worked really hard to put a full equity focus on transportation, which has never been done before. Transportation has always been, let's build the road here. Who cares who lived there before? What happens to the neighborhood after you build it? Whatever. We spent 90 listening sessions bringing everybody to the table, communities that had never talked about transportation policy before. And, uh, and um, that uh, how do we bring them to the table? How do we affect those change? Bring projects back to their neighborhoods that have been impacted by previous transportation projects and help out those neighborhoods that have been dissected by major roads and then suffer the uh, uh, air pollution from those transportation projects. So trying to bring that picture in, I can talk all day on this. I'm wrapping it up as quick as I can, but I love to talk more. If you have questions, let me know and, and know that what we're doing in this house proposed transportation project has more of an equity process to it than any other has in the past. Thank you. All right, so we are pretty much out of time. Uh, you will have a chance to say um, some closing words, uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to, um, let people know that thank you so much for being here and making this a success. Um, also, um, US News released their state's ranking and um, in case you haven't heard, Washington is at the top for the second year in a row. So mm -hmm. there's that. Okay, so let's start with closing remarks, Senator. Yeah, I just, thanks everyone for being here and next year I am very optimistic we'll be able to do these in person once again. <laughs> Definitely looking forward to doing it in person and definitely, you know, we still have half the session to go. So continue to reach out to our offices, make sure you stay connected with us. Um, I know that we've been very engaged, you know, I know I have been with constituents on on the issues that you brought forward um, and want to make sure that we're staying connected and, and in touch. And I saw in the chat, some have more details to share, all of that. I, I highly value that and greatly appreciate your time spending your energy and um, you know, bringing your questions to the table today. So thank you all for that. Yes, thank you for being engaged. That's what we need in a democracy, engaged folks asking the questions. Don't let us just run around and do the work. We wanna know what you have to say, what you think, why it's important to you, how it affects you. Because these, thing, these things we do have effects on people's lives and we wanna do it the right way. And, and we don't always have all the picture. Believe me, I have my experience, but I don't have your experience. And so I don't bring the whole picture all the time. To what we're trying to do so the more you give us input is the best we can do to make things better and that's the goal what everything we do should make things better for our community and our society that's that's the bottom line in, in what judging what we do so the more information we have the more input from you that will make it better so we need you to do this uh, and keep engaged and uh, get everybody else engaged you can uh, you talk to thank you all right, thank you. Um, folks, if you got here late and you missed the first part of it, pretty soon we will, we will be posting this um, video as an archive in your members' Facebooks and websites. So you can then go and watch it again or share it with your neighbor and friends or, you know. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time.